Well, thank you for joining me. Back in 2011, when Grace and I first presented at the Ancestral Health Symposium, we brought up the idea of the microbiome, the fact that inside of our guts we have anywhere from what is it, 10 to 100 trillion bacteria living there, estimates are fluctuating. But we can dig deeper and say not only inside of our guts do we have a microbiome, but actually inside of our cells we have one as well. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, what are we going to talk about? We're gonna talk about aliens, right? We are sending a spacecraft, Voyager, has passed beyond our solar system last year. And NASA and maybe Elon Musk is sending people out into the universe. And what are we likely to encounter? We're going to ask the question, why are bacteria not the size of basketballs? Why are they so small? We're going to, of course, talk about mitochondria, which is the subject of today's talk. And we're going to cover more, all right? This is me. I look a little bit different. I am a naturopathic doctor here in Seattle, Redmond. We deal with gut problems, autoimmune diseases, and hard-to-treat cases. And it's those hard-to-treat cases that are constantly pushing us to discover and learn more. And facing the microbiome and now the mitochondria are additional pieces that we need to tackle. All right, so Dan Party kind of beat me to this a little bit, but I'm going to try and encapsulate life on Earth in just one slide. So let's see if we can do it. Yes, about 13.8 billion years ago, the universe began. So we believe about 4.5 billion years ago, this ball of dirt that we are on now formed. Come on, you. Somewhere between 4.3 and 3 billion years ago, life began. So it first was thought that they were what is called chemoautotrophic. Uh, they got their energy from high energy uh, particles, sulfur compounds, and various things in the environment. They, uh, life then went on to begin to utilize sugar in terms of the glycolytic pathways. And about 3 billion years ago, cyanobacteria, or the first true photosynthetic life, evolved. Now, we're going to skip the magic moment for a minute. We'll come back to it. But about 800 to 600 million years ago, multicellular life began. So basically everything that we are able to see without a microscope. 68 million years ago, we had T-Rex. 62 million years ago, we had terror birds. And somewhere between two and 300,000 years ago, modern humans made our debut on this stage. So what happened between 3 billion years ago and 800 million years ago is the central piece of what we're talking about today. And that magic is known as endosymbiosis. So symbiosis means the peaceful or coexisting living together, what we do with most of our gut bacteria. Endo means inside of. So in what's considered maybe the second rarest event to have occurred on planet Earth after the appearance of life itself, About 1.8 billion years ago, one life form swallowed up another life form, and instead of one or both of them dying, they decided that this seemed like a pretty good idea, right? And all of us that are present and all life that we can see are descended from this particular event. Now, it then went on to happen a second time. And if there are any plants that are listening to this lecture, you are all the descendants of that second endosymbiotic event. Now, if we encounter aliens, we are most likely not going to encounter our friendly, fun-loving xenomorphs that like to burst out of people's chests. Most alien life is probably going to be more of the bacterial type because that endosymbiotic event is considered so astoundingly rare. All right, so life on Earth in one slide. Ta-da! Thank you. All right. So this endosymbiosis, both life forms, right? The original cell and the swallowed cell, which we think is related to the rickettsia species or or genus of bacteria, decided that they were better off and happier working together than they were 
separately. So all, almost all of the cells in our body have mitochondria in them. The sole exception that we're aware of are red blood cells. Red blood cells do not have any mitochondria because they are charged with carrying oxygen around the body and mitochondria burn oxygen. So it would be kind of redundant if the very things that were carrying oxygen around your body used it all up. Now, on the other extreme, your liver cells have around 2,000 mitochondria per cell. So again, if we want to do the math and we say we have like 10 trillion bacteria in our guts, I haven't done the math, somebody else can do it. We have, you know, between zero and 2,000 of them inside every single one of the cells of our body. Now, what do mitochondria do. So the main, their main but not exclusive function is going to be the production of energy. With mitochondria, we can produce about 13 times more energy than without them. So people ask the question, like, why do we breathe? Why do we need oxygen? Fundamentally, without oxygen, mitochondria cannot function. You cannot produce that 13 times more energy. And in fact, you cannot produce enough energy to keep the cells of your body alive. And that is why we breathe. And that is why we need oxygen. Now, that brings us to the question of why are bacteria not the size of basketballs? Setting aside some physics problems with size and cell membranes and volumes and such, fundamentally bacteria are so small because without mitochondria they cannot produce enough energy to make themselves larger. So you can thank mitochondria for the fact that you without a microscope can see anything at all. All right. Mitochondria, however, do far more than just produce energy. While it is a major function, they are involved with death signaling. So they tell cells when they should die. Of course, with cancer, we know that many of those processes are, in fact, messed up. They also are involved in a lot of cell signaling. One key aspect that we focus on a lot here in ancestral health is insulin and insulin resistance. So insulin resistance largely is due to signals that are coming from the mitochondria. Now, Chris Masterjohn has given some very nice uh, lectures and podcasts talking about this topic, but I wanted to mention that in general, I don't really believe in pathology. I think most of what we see is really adaptive physiology. So trees are at their best when they are straight. The tree that you can see that is leaning over in the background there is doomed to a shorter and less successful life than the trees that you see in the foreground that are standing up straight. So we could argue that that tree is pathological because it will not live as long or as well as the trees in the foreground, or we could look at it and say that that tree has adapted to its situation and is trying to make the best of things. So while in this picture it doesn't look like it, we could argue that if in fact growing up straight for that tree meant that it couldn't get sunlight, then it was faced with the option of making an adaptive choice that would in the long run doom it or not even being able to live in the first place. So when we look at insulin resistance for the most part, we are looking at the mitochondria telling the system that they are overloaded with nutrition and cannot continue to uptake and burn more fuel without causing irreparable damage to themselves. So the very reactive oxygen species that can kill off mitochondria are necessary signaling factors that tell them what to do. We need some reactive oxygen species, but when we get too many, problems arise, all right? Other things that mitochondria do, they produce steroid cholesterol and therefore the steroids and steroid hormones that we all like so very much. Now, there are a whole host of genetic mitochondrial diseases. As you may or may not know, mitochondria are the only known organelle or little piece of a cell that has its own separate 
DNA aside from the nucleus of the cell. Now, in the 1.8 billion years since this event happened, they have actually offloaded the majority of their DNA over to the nucleus, and mammalian mitochondria typically only have about 37 genes left, but they do have critically important uh, DNA, uh, largely. This comes from the mother so moms out there, unfortunately, mitochondrial issues are on you guys. Although some data suggests that possibly some of the paternal or father's DNA in terms of mitochondria might come through um, as well. So we're not really gonna spend any time on these. There's not much currently that we can do about them. But we're gonna focus a little bit more on the interplay between what are thought to be a combination of genetic and environmental diseases that affect mitochondria. And this list is far more relevant to what most people are facing. So we see everything from autism and Parkinson's disease up there, schizophrenia, which we just had a lecture on, dementias and Alzheimer's diseases, epilepsy, epilepsies, strokes, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic fatigue syndrome as well. So a genetic weakness in mitochondria combined with an environmentally disruptive factor equals bad news for a lot of people that I see. All right, let's talk about the care and feeding of our mitochondria. Now it's important when we zoom down to this level, we're looking at the leaves or even the part of leaves when we talk about mitochondria, that we don't get lost there and we actually zoom back to the trees and the forest and put this in context. Because as someone said yesterday, people don't eat for their mitochondria, right? They eat for a whole variety of reasons and a lot of their li other facets of their lifestyle as well. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but just this will go out to the internet in case someone has not heard of ancestral precepts or maybe a hundred years from now, if they're dodging terminators and you know they get a chance to log into the internet, they'll go, whoa. So we know that environmental mismatches in the, <laughs> There we go, cool. <laughs> in the way that we eat, in the way that we move or do not move, in the way that we sleep or do not sleep, in the way that we handle our chronic stress loads, which I believe are a really major factor in a lot of what's going on for us, in our social connections and networks. We also know that the mismatches in our microbiome, in our genetics, in our epigenetics, and in our toxic and environmental exposures that we get. If we take all of these factors, I firmly believe, aside from some of those genetic pieces that we mentioned before, we're looking at the vast majority of disease that is out there. So. Having laid that, found, that foundation, we can talk about taking care of your mitochondria. We can break it down to nutrition and exercise, hormonal balance and toxicity, and testing can be done if it's needed or desired. So, mitochondria respond to energy demands that are put upon them. We know that cells have from zero to 2,000 of them, and they are constantly in flux. We are losing and gaining mitochondria, just like we can imagine the cell itself divides and replicates. Mitochondria have that same capacity. So exercise, truly of any variety, but exercise or increased energy demand on the system the mitochondria will respond by not only upregulating themselves, but by creating more of them. A good nutritious whole foods diet, we can argue ad nauseum about carbs and protein and fats, but we need a good quality nutritious diet to supply the foundational nutrients that mitochondria need. And here are some of them. So as we've said, mitochondria produce a lot of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. These are little dangerous molecules, or they can be if we don't have adequate what's called exogenous from the outside or endogenous produced on the inside, antioxidants to take care of 
those reactive oxygen species. B vitamins, Ben Lynch, if you were here for his talk, talked about the importance of folate and many of the other B vitamins in running what's known as the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. Magnesium is a key mineral, carnitine or acetyl L-carnitine, alpha lipoic acid, coenzyme Q10, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that one in a moment, ribose, phosphatidylcholine, and others are all important. Again, a nutritious, nutrient-dense whole foods diet should supply many of these things. We know, for example, CoQ10, which should be produced internally, is really best available in organ meats, especially heart, which a lot of people are not eating. Hormonal balance is a critical piece of taking care of your mitochondria. So anybody out there with thyroid issues or thinking about thyroid, how actually we know that thyroid causes us to have energy and metabolism, how does it do that? One of the key ways is the T3 hormone actually penetrates the cell and activates at the level of the mitochondria. So when we talk about good thyroid function, we know that a key piece um, is that we are taking care of our mitochondria. And without good hormonal function, without sufficient thyroid function in this case, we can supply everything else that our mitochondria need and not that much is going to happen. Now, mitochondria are also very, very sensitive to estrogen levels as well. They have estrogen receptors, which stimulate a whole host of different functions. And we know, unfortunately, that problems in and around estrogen and the amount of xenoestrogens and other things that we have on our, in our environments are major factors and a piece of what's going on. All right. Um, I wanted to talk about three common toxins that we all are either exposed to or at least know someone who is exposed to that can hurt your mitochondria. The first is Tylenol, right? Now, Tylenol is not deadly dangerous, and if you happen to touch the box, you'll keel over and die or anything, okay? However, most people do not recognize that it is a potentially problematic substance. Even more so, the, most people can give too much to children as well. Now, there's whole debates about the fact that children are not equivalent to adults, just scaled down in size as far as their different body systems and pieces work. And there's some real debate in the community about whether dosing for things like Tylenol in kids is actually, uh, you know, you're giving them too much. Now we certainly know people with chronic pain issues can tend to take Tylenol like M&Ms or other types of candy, right? We know some cases of football players, for example, who've overdosed on the use of Tylenol. Now what acetaminophen does, again, it is the most common cause of acute liver failure in the United States. Now acetaminophen causes this cascade where cellular glutathione becomes depleted. It, that leaves mitochondrial oxidative and nitrosative stress unbuffered. So the, the glutathione that should stop or control that stress is no longer able to do it. That's going to then trigger the release of apoptosis-inducing factor. Remember we talked about that mitochondria control the death signals for the cell, and then that's gonna cause nuclear DNA fragmentation, which as you could imagine, does not sound like a very good thing, okay? So high amounts of acetaminophen deplete cellular glutathione. Where do we know that the most mitochondria are in the body? 2,000 mitochondria per liver cell approximately, so the liver gets the brunt of it. Unable to quench the oxidative and nitrosative stress, sends out the death signal, and you have liver cells die and people go into acute liver failure, all right? So, acetaminophen can be used safely, of course, being a naturopath, I think there are many other and better options for people, but it can be used safely, but we wanna respect dosages, and we wanna be doubly careful with our children and watching their doses. Now, I love the outdoors too. I suppose we all just need to take Lipitor. This is a Canadian <laughs> Lipitor uh, ad that was out there. So statins, yes, our favorite punching bag from the conventional medical community. But we look at statins and we find 
you know, mixed results, right? In cell cultures, they find that statins are going to promote mitochondrial permeability, which is not a good thing. They're gonna, again, generate the, that apoptotic proteins, so they're gonna start the death signaling. We're gonna find that they stop or reduce CoQ10 production, which is gonna interfere with the efficient functioning of mitochondria. Human studies are going to yield conflicting results for people, and it is again thought that genetics are going to play a role if someone is more sensitive or has you know, genetic weaknesses in these areas, they're going to be more susceptible. We see that the incidence of what's called statin-induced myotoxicity, myo means muscle, so statin-induced muscle toxicity presents in between seven and about 30% of patients who are given statins. We know that many times conventional doctors ignore these things. People will come in complaining of them, especially if they're not really significant, but again, and in studies, we see that they present with mitochondrial damage, uh, you know, reduced production of ATP, which is how we power our bodies, increases in those reactive oxidative, uh, uh, reactive oxygen species, and the activation of apoptosis or death, proteolysis, the breaking down of protein, muscle remodeling. That's why we see fatigue and cramps and muscle pains and elevated enzymes suggestive of muscle damage. Right, so but roughly between 10 and 30 percent, and of course, dose scales. So the higher dose statins you are, someone is on, the more likely they are to have these problems. All right. Now, interestingly, we've found that there is a correlation between statins and type 2 diabetes. So why? Right. What this suggests is that we see a reduction in insulin secretion. And we found the same thing, a torvastatin, which is the, the, tr uh, the generic name for Lipitor. Again, same thing, found to increase reactive ox oxygen species, uh, collapse the, the mitochondrial membrane potential, cause apoptosis signaling to occur. And what's important is this was shown in the pancreas, right? So if you have your mitochondria sending death signaling in your pancreas, which produces your insulin levels, and you see your insulin levels falling, it's not really that big of a stretch to suggest that you are poisoning and killing off some of your pancreas. All right. The third toxin that can hurt your mitochondria, and this is interesting. So our good friend Roundup. All right. So what we see again and again, a collapse of the electrical potential, more permeabilization, meaning the mitochondria can't work well. Now this is the key interesting point. Roundup and glyphosate are not the same thing. Glyphosate is in Roundup, but they are not the same thing. Glyphosate, which is considered the active ingredient of Roundup alone, doesn't seem to affect the ability of the mitochondrial mitochondria to make energy, but Roundup does, okay? So we see here that mixtures of glyphosate and what is called TN20, which is a surfactant to help spread out um, and disperse the glyphosate, that was a problem, right? TN20 seems to disrupt the integrity of the cellular barrier. In other words, it seems that mitochondria by themselves can prevent glyphosate from getting inside of them. But you put in these surfactants, which, which basically destroy the ability of the mitochondria to keep glyphosate out, and now you have a problem, all right? So three common toxins. We are all exposed to glyphosate, either directly or indirectly. We all have or will things like acetaminophen, and we all will probably be offered the opportunity to take statin drugs as well, all right? So when we talk about detoxification, just very briefly, right, we have what goes in, what comes out, and what stays inside. And the difference in that is really up to the, how well we can biotransform or detoxify many of these substances and clear them from our bodies.
Now, in a very condensed way, we can obviously limit our exposure. None of us need to take acetaminophen. There are other and better choices. Uh, we can refuse statins unless it absolutely makes sense for us. Um, and, you know, we can choose an organic diet and do our very best to reduce our exposure. Now, again, a nutrient-dense diet with sufficient protein, because protein is necessary in order to do a lot of the steps of detoxification. And this is where, you know, I very much disagree with many of our vegan um, and vegetarian colleagues who feel, yes, they are getting sufficient protein in some ways. We are exposed to a toxic load that is unprecedented for our species or the world. And so we need to make sure we have enough protein. You can see Chris Master John's talk yesterday for more about high protein diets. Crucifers, things like broccoli, uh, cauliflower, kale, uh, alliums, things like garlic and onions are all big superstars. You must drink enough water. If it is, makes sense, you can use supplemental nutrients and various herbs. You must be peeing and pooping regularly. You can talk to Grace about pooping. She loves talking about pooping. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I've gone on a number of times about what is today a design flaw in our system known as enterohepatic recirculation, um, where, uh, you know, we can sort of shoot, shoot ourselves in the foot. And uh, in the interest of time, I will move on. Now, you can test for mitochondrial function. Grace has talked about this. Other doctors have talked about this. These are pieces of an organic acid test that look at key metabolites in mitochondrial function. As you can see, for this individual, most of these metabolites are either normal or running on the low end. We can see in another example, most of these metabolites, and this was a patient with chronic fatigue syndrome, were all running on the high end. Uh, they were not processing or running uh, their, their, their um, Krebs cycle effectively. Again, we can look for various things. This is ticoglycine, another marker that can look. This person, it was all very reasonable. Um, but testing can be done. Is this something you must run out and do? Of course it is not. Um, but if you have or suspect you have some issues, there are tests that can be done. Please just don't ask most MDs to do this because unfortunately, they don't know these things exist right now, and we're hoping to change that. All right, one last piece that has caught my interest lately is what is known as photobiomodulation. It has a cool name, and it involves lasers, which are like awesome, right? <laughs> So anything with lasers has to be like really cool. Um, so as you can see by its name, modulation, biomodulation would be anything that you're changing a biologic system. Photo means light. So while most people have never heard about it here, in fact, I didn't even know about it until a little ways back, um, it is gotten a lot of study worldwide. And we see that what are called low level laser therapies have been shown to stimulate healing, relieve pain, and reduce inflammation. Now, now, what makes this relevant to this talk is that they seem to do that through the mitochondria. The use of infrared or laser lights seems to directly stimulate what is known as cytochrome C oxidase, a key component of the mitochondria, and it leads to increases in ATP what mitochondria do for us, and it activates a wide range of transcription factors. So we see cells surviving, we see them growing. This has been shown to be tremendously useful um, in anything affecting the brain, abdominal fat, wounds, lungs, and spinal cords. So in my opinion, um, anybody who's working with patients with burn issues, anybody who's working with patients uh, with neurologic issues, you know, these are not lasers that cut or burn. These are low-level lasers, and the worst thing that happens is mostly nothing. So um, I have not done a lot with this, but it is certainly something that has piqued my interest, um, and I do not think that like a laser pointer will get you the, the effect that you need, all right? So we have come to the end of our talk today about mitochondria. You can go deeply into the leaves, if you will, looking at the different biochemical pathways. And Chris Master John probably dreams about things like that. <laughs> um, but for most of us, 
it comes down to fundamentals about the care and feeding of our mitochondria, which mostly coincide with the care and feeding of a healthy human body. All of the things that we talk about in ancestral health are directly relevant to keeping healthy mitochondria. And if you do those things and you find that you are, your health is not where you want it to be, please know that there are other aspects to delve into. There are other tests that can be done. There are things um, for everyone out there. So I urge anyone who is sick or has problems, please do not give up. Please don't think that there is no hope for you. There is much that can be done for people. All right, if anyone is interested, I can take some questions now. And thank you so much. Yeah, just a question about um, protein levels, and you referred to sort of the adequate amount taking enough, and I wasn't at that talk oh, sure. yesterday, but it seems sure. to be a bit of a moving target in terms of what the right amount is, and, sure. and Mark Sisson recently in his revised book referenced that the amount might be lower than previously thought, about a half a gram per pound of lean body mass. What are your right. thoughts on that? Well. The thing is, you know, depending on where you look, you can abstract. It, there, it's a complicated question, obviously, and you can see that no one, you know, has the answer. Or if someone has the answer, you might want to be a bit skeptical of them, right? So it depends a little bit. We know that in order, in, in what I was referencing, in order to detoxify, we need to have sufficient levels of various amino acids that are necessary to run those pathways, right? We know that the body is going to have a pool of amino acids and it's going to have to allocate them to various things. So one of the arguments we can make is what is the state of the person? For example, we can take an extreme state to go back to someone with a burn injury. Their protein intake needs to be extremely high because they're going to be trying to synthesize new skin, new connective tissue, and all these different processes that are going on for them. Someone on the other end of the spectrum who's not particularly physically active, not under a lot of stress, not doing a lot, their protein needs are going to be significantly lower. So while I can't speak to you in terms of, well, should it be 0.5 or 0.8 or 1.2 or 1.5, what I can argue is that most people in our community get adequate levels of protein, but a lot of people out there in the larger, uh, the larger audience will see they're scraping, in my opinion, they're scraping by with, you know, suboptimal levels of protein. Thank you. Yeah. Great talk, Tim. Thanks. I expected no less from you. <laughs> um, no pressure. I, maybe I missed it, but what was the name of that mitochondrial test that you... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Just, just in general? General, yeah. The organic acid, there, the, I can give you some specifics, Keith, but the, there, uh, there are a number of companies that run what are called organic acid testing. Most of those tests will include sections for mitochondria. Thank you. Cool. Anything else, or did I dazzle everyone into silence, or are you desperate for lunch? I, <laughs> I have one more question. Sure. Um, the photobiomodulation, yeah. um, I guess this is a two-part question. One, yeah. um, how would you go about, um, are there like practitioners who are certified in it, or how would you find someone? That yeah, I mean, that's part of my homework, that I've been looking into who actually knows what they're talking about. Um, and I can share some more specifics with you um, later if we want, but basically I've been looking at who's been practicing and doing this for a long time and it seems to be you need the right equipment and you need the right protocols. It's just not enough to grab a laser pointer and just start like waving it all over your body basically. Uh, yeah. um, so there seem to be some people who know what they're talking about and I've been trying to track them down and figure out what's involved. So, and then secondly, do yeah. you know how long it takes to see those reductions in inflammation? Like, Yeah, my understanding is that it can happen very quickly. Like general um, protocols seem to be you're exposed to the lights for about 20 to 30 minutes. And it seems to be like you can get a really rapid response. Um, and most of the protocols seem to be doing between like 10 and depending on what's going on for someone, 50 sessions of those. Um, and it seems to be um, that you get an immediate effect and then, you know, as the system is able to reduce inflammation and heal itself, that those effects 
continue on for people. And certainly, um, in talking to some people with traumatic brain injuries and other issues, um, they their experiences seem to be that things improve dramatically and then they might still continue doing top-up sessions once in a while. So um, it's a really interesting, they're really interesting therapies to me. So, yeah, absolutely. Anything else? All right, folks, thank you.